today we are going to be talking about uh, identity development in young adults and adolescents with Chird here. Uh, so if we just jump right to it. Uh, so Chird, what actually is open-ended development? Well, open-ended development is it's kind of as it, the word suggests. Uh, it is development not towards any particular goal, but towards becoming more proficient in all the little things that you need to be proficient in, in order to, to be an effective, safe uh, and, and productive uh, individual. Uh, so it is, it is impossible to say what you should optimize and you should optimize uh, in essence everything in the context of everything else so that you can contribute in the most safe and productive way to your own life and that to the lives of others. So that is open-ended development. That, wow, that, that, so it's, it doesn't have a necessary goal then? Nope. And the moment it has a goal, it closed itself and then you would call it closed development. And so what we do at the university is mostly uh, development towards a particular goal. Uh, to, to getting an exam, uh, showing that you are proficient in a particular thing. Uh, and that is the opposite of open-ended development. Uh, it is part of development uh, because you need certain skills, uh, but it is not the open-ended part of development. So how does open-ended development relate to life and, say, young adults? Well open-ended development is that development where we always do uh, and that, that ends in something that we all know and that is wisdom and that is self-actualization. And both wisdom and self-actualization are not endpoints in itself. Uh, it is just a state of being able to interact with the world in a very effective manner while you are being uh, the, 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 the source of your own uh, strategies to interact with the world. And so someone who is wise, uh, you can trust that person uh, to contribute to the world as an individual without guidance of someone else. Uh, and, and that is also the key point of self-actualization. Uh, so every animal, every living being uh, has to be able to, to, to live its life on its own while contributing to the whole. Well, that is the key point of self-actualization, and it is also the key point of wisdom. And so in, in that sense, it, it fits squarely in, in what we would normally find a normal, healthy, uh, developed life. So would you say that open-ended development is a form, uh, is self-actualization is a form of open-ended development, or are they different? Uh, I would say self-actualization is the manifestation of open-ended development. And so it is, it is not really the outcome, uh, but, but uh, an essential part of the process. And the okay. same wisdom. So they, uh, all they all develop at the, they all develop in sort of tan tandem with each other. Yes, yes, I would say so, yeah. Okay, Very nice. Sense. So how do these concepts um, relate to the person and to the individual? Well, that is, that is interesting. So it is the individual that has to do this. Uh, and and it, the way the individual does this defines the individual. Uh, and that leads to, to the concept of identity. Uh, so what everyone has to do uh, is to become a person on themselves. Uh, so when you are uh, a baby, uh, you are a very dependent little bit, completely uh, dependent on care. Uh, but when you're an adult, uh, you should become the person who is the guide of his own life or her own life. Uh, and and well, the, the transition between uh, being needing constant care and guidance and uh, being an independent self-decider who can contribute to the world, uh, that is the difference between a child, say, and adulthood. Uh, uh, and it is also uh, the ability to, uh, no, and, and that is associated with the formation of an identity. Uh, so the moment you're able to contribute to the world with your own self, uh, with your own strategies, then you are showing that you have the, a developed identity. I see. So 
your identity is self-generated? Yeah, and it is something like a theory of me as an actor in the world or a self theory. Yeah. Okay. So uh, your identity is uh, is how you look at yourself. Maybe not even while thinking about this. Uh, how do I look myself? Uh, how do I look at myself? No, it is much more. How do I respond to the daily challenges of life? Yeah. And and everyone does it in a slightly different way. And that defines their identity. And that makes everyone an individual, a, 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 a specific personality. Uh, but with a, a well-developed identity, there's a lot of commonality in the, in, the, in the strategies that you have now and the strategies that you have later. So with a well-developed event, uh, identity, you can uh, leave traces in the environment as part of your life strategy and then build on it. Yeah, so with that, with that well-developed identity, uh, then you 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 leave uh, a set of traces in the world. You build on it, and you build ever more complex uh, structures. And 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 your identity, well-developed identity, is a sign that you can keep your structure, keep your strategy. That it actually is a good strategy, and you don't have to change it all the time. Yeah. So the stability of your strategies, your way of interacting with the world, are a sign of your identity and of a well-developed identity. Okay, so consistency in the individual is a sign of wisdom? Uh, that's an interesting. I, I guess so, but not necessarily. No, it's a good question. Because there are two ways of, of being consistent in your life. And, and there is a, that actually has a name, uh, commitments. Yeah, so uh, at a certain moment in their lives, and maybe not in every life, but in many lives, people commit to a specific life course. And that life course, that can be a life course that fits completely in the social structures that you have grown up with. And then you adopt your socially, uh, the, your social structures and you identify completely with them. And that is one way of, of uh, committing to a particular life strategy. Uh, for example, uh, uh, you, uh, in your life, you always thought that the most important thing was uh, to have a job and to become very good at a job. Yeah, well, that is then you comply yourself uh, uh, with a particular system and you try to become as good as you can in that system and you derive your identity from that system. That is one way of, of showing uh, clear commitments and a clear life strategy. Um, the other way is... Uh, it's independent of such a system in which you come up with your own uh, strategies and that you then use your own strategies in whatever aspect of your life. And, and that is much more associated with wisdom. Yeah, so uh, being a very good operator in a system, uh, that is much more associated with a high level of intelligence and, and, and a great compliance with the system. Uh, but mm -hmm. Uh, open-ended development is much more associated with development uh, of everything in the context of everything else, which is not in the confines of a system. Uh, so uh, if you develop that, then you develop much more independently and therefore as an independent uh, individual. Okay, so you can also get, uh, you can also be a sort of a consistent person via close-ended development. Yeah. I understand. But then uh, you make yourself completely dependent on the existence and and and, and uh, the existence and and little change of the system that you uh, complied with. Uh, so uh, because if you are very much prepared for a certain system and the system disappears for whatever reason, you're completely without any tools uh, and yeah. you lost all your adequacy at at one moment in time. So that will not happen to the other way, which is not dependent on the system. So if that, if, if systems disappear, okay, well, uh, you just create another system for yourself or... Yes, is, is this, uh, do you think this is why people who leave, um, leave cults, for example, feel very lost after they've walked away from the social group? Yep, yeah, yeah very much so. Yeah. And 
I think you also see it in people who uh, who get fired, for example, from an uh, organization. Yeah. And that, so if they really derive their identity from the organization, then, well, there's very little left. And then they have to rebuild their own identity, which is a pretty painful uh, an unsettling process. Or when relationships break down and you lose a group of friends, things like yep. this. Things like that. Yep. Okay, so how does how does this sort of concept of identity therefore relate to mental health? If we're talking about, you know, this sense of feeling lost. Well, um, this is this is rather tricky and we don't know it yet fully. Uh, but uh, a well-developed identity is a set of of, uh, in, of strategies to interact with the world and yeah. with every aspect of the world. And yeah. the better these strategies work, uh, the more you will be confronted with the positive benefits of those strategies. And those strategies, of course, they can only work when they are realistic. So realistic, realistic ideas about the world uh, are an indication that you follow strategies uh, that uh, that can actually work in the world mm -hmm. and that can make you then happy and, 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 and give you a lot of a sense of uh, accomplishment in the world uh, and, and a high sense of uh, self-assuredness, etc. and self-esteem, etc. So uh, mental health then, then uh, is associated with a high mental health is associated with I can deal with pretty much everything. I'm an uh, autonomous person in this world and I can deal with it. Yes. While a low sense of uh, mental health uh, is someone who is struggling with uh, a number or many aspects of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and that leads, of course, to feelings of being lost in the world, of being unable uh, to deal with whatever life throws at you. Uh, yeah. And therefore, losing your confidence in yourself, uh, being constantly uh, confronted with problems uh, that seem to follow you all the time. And why do they seem to follow you? Uh, perhaps uh, because you, in part, uh, uh, caused them yourself or perpetuate them yourself. Uh, but anyway, you are constantly in problems. So you're thinking in terms of how can I get rid of those problems? You typically start to think all kinds of circular thoughts that will never help you to to solve the problem. And that is very much associated with mental health or low mental health. And of course, it, it happens a lot. And it happens also a lot in, in, in uh, people, uh, at adolescents, uh, that uh, not necessarily have had the opportunity to learn whatever skills are actually necessary. Uh, so they then miss the skills that they have to use. And that makes them then uh, feel feel lost, uh, low self-esteem, uh, depressive, uh, those kind of things. So this, this, the negative side, uh, if you view of this, is that it is, uh, you did it to yourself, you should have learned better skills. Um, and then you can blame yourself only, uh, which is probably uh, not always fair or often unfair. Um, but the positive side of it is that you can actually take control of your life again by simply learning skills or mm -hmm. trying to escape from environments that you are not fit with to deal uh, and, and then go to an environment that you have the skills with uh, and then develop your skills higher and higher. Uh, so this, this is a, a mixed bag. Okay, so people, so you would say that uh, a person who is in a more problematic environment or someone who has to encounter um, more problems than someone else um, is more likely to have uh, developed sort of poor mental health? Yeah, and sometimes, and th th this again is also interesting because I know enough people who had a very unfortunate youth, and they were confronted with problems that they simply couldn't cope with, and no yes. one of their age can cope with. But the interesting thing is that at some point in time, they learn their way out of it, and, uh, and then they have a very rich basis of, of life experiences that other people of their age don't have. 
And that then is a very good basis for, 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 for wisdom and self-development. So it is not necessarily that all the shit that you had to deal with when you were growing up uh, is, is, is only a, a negative thing. Uh, of course, it feels very negatively when you are in the middle of it. Uh, but weirdly enough, it is also a learning opportunity. So, yes, because this is this the sense of when people have come out of, for example, uh, periods in their life where they've had poor mental health, whether that being anxiety or depression, when they come out of it, they often say that they feel stronger as a result. Yep. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, okay. But this is a fragile type of thing uh, because... Uh, especially when you're just out of a difficult period in your life, uh, you are still fairly fragile. Eh? So uh, you, you, you are easily to be put down uh, by, by all kinds of forces in your environment. So especially at that stage, you, you really need to find a place that is supportive. But because you've learned a lot, uh, you have a chance actually to, to, to build a firm foundation. So some people who never experienced all the negative aspects, they actually miss those opportunities and they will just continue in their normal ways and then end up in a situation maybe 10 years later that is actually less uh, beneficial simply be because they never had the learning opportunities. Okay, but um, so... But mental mental health isn't just an internalized thing. It it is also affected by your environment and external factors. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, and that eventually uh, your mental health is also expressed in in your body. Uh, so so for example, stress stress is uh, the lack of perceived control. When you're stressed for a very long time, uh, you, your body uh, responds to the stress situation. Uh, but if, if it is a fruitless uh, response, because you never are able to, to, to solve your stressful situation, and after a while you end up in a, something not unsimilar to, uh, to learned helplessness, uh, a depression situation in which your, your, the lower part of your brain basically says to you, Please don't do anything because you're going to make a mess out of it. Uh, so don't do anything. Yeah. And those people then are, well, find it very difficult to motivate themselves and to, to do anything other than sleep. And probably should sleep a lot uh, and, and try to, to uh, rebuild their lives uh, when their body allows them to do that again. So th what you're talking about is people in London in uh, crazy sort of seven till ten jobs who are constantly stressed that they yeah. are their their brain is quite literally unable to cope. Yep, and then you see lots of people with burnouts. Yeah, so they have been contributing to whatever company they have been working on for most of their lives, and they have been neglecting whatever is really important to themselves. And at some point the body says, uh, sorry, uh, stop, don't do anything anymore. Uh, and then people hopefully uh, uh, restart their lives again and, and, and restart it in a way that is much more healthy for their whole body. And that is also an, an, a nice example of open-ended development because they were in the closed-ended development and being the best corporate individual they could be. And now they have to optimize their whole life in the context of everything else. Uh, and, and many people uh, learn from it, uh, but of course you want to avoid it. And people with a well-developed identity never get a burnout. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah. So uh, do you think that contemporary life in the way that it's structured right now is um, it's, it favors people who are close-ended developers. Yeah, very much. Okay. So yeah. can you then extrapolate that and say that contemporary life is detrimental to a lot of people's mental health? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I think that is absolutely the case. And it's getting more and more difficult to... Uh, to self-decide on your own life 
according to your own needs, because all your examples in society, everything you're exposed to in the media, all the expectations that schools and, and, and businesses and family and etc. impose on you, uh, they are all kinds of shared expectations that might not fit your life at all and your and, and the things that you need at all. Yeah. At some point you have to break with it. Yeah. Find yeah. out what you actually want. Yes. Very important. And that then uh, is part of your identity development. Uh, because the moment you find your own strategies, you are building your own identity. Uh, you, you have to find your own uh, effective strategies. Yeah, those, because the moment they are not effective, you have to change them after a while because they are not effective. And therefore, uh, those strategies will never become part of your identity. At, at least they will be part of your identity for a short while. Uh, and then they ha you have to leave them and you search for something else and yet for something else and yet for something else. So that is um, a non-stable identity, uh, which, which a fair amount of people actually have. Yeah. Okay. So if we're talking about um, identity and you're talking about sort of instability and uh, stability and identity, then how how is identity actually structured? Well, that's... Uh, we haven't talked about it, but that identity is a is a really well studied topic. And, so, uh, and um, there is uh, James Marshall already in the 60s. He, he structured it the way that I, I'm, I'm describing it now. And there is a researcher, Brzezonski, who studied uh, identity pretty much his whole life and every aspect of it. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm reflecting uh, their ideas, especially Brzezonski's ideas. Um, but uh, there are identity has two axes, and uh, and one is the stability of commitments, and I already talked about that. So a commitment is a is a strategy that you follow uh, in your life, and that is successful. Uh, and so because it's successful, you never have to leave it. Yeah? So it's a it's a strategy that fits to the realities of this world, and you have to find it yourself. Um, as long as you don't have it, you can't really commit. So you can't really commit uh, to, for example, uh, a long-term relationship because you, it doesn't necessarily fit in your life strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't uh, commit to, uh, to, to uh, the idea that I want to become a doctor because half a year later, uh, you might want to become a dentist or uh, a lawyer or whatever. Yeah. So uh, all those, those things that for people uh, give stability uh, in their lives uh, is a commitment uh, and, and, uh, and and the moment you 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 don't have many of those commitments you're constantly searching for something for, for of value uh, then you have the absence of uh, commitment and and you have not really a very stable basis so that is one axis mm -hmm. commitments versus uh, no commitments and the other one is a uh, crisis uh, versus no crisis and what is the crisis the crisis is uh, whether you have liberated yourself from ideas of your social peer group that you were exposed to in your youth, and, and you have changed many of those ideas into something that are your ideas. So you have left a part of your you, uh, youth certainties, and you have replaced them by your adult uh, certainties. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, they called it that. that they call it a crisis when, when it happens. And the crisis is that you simply, you have to unlearn a number of things and replace them with your own strategies. So then you have uh, four different identities. So the people who, have, uh, who don't show real commitments and had no crisis are called uh, the diffusions. And diffusions because they, they wander around all the time. They... Uh, they haven't done much self-exploration and hence they don't know each other, they don't know themselves really well and it leads to a kind of a fluid and unstable self-identity. Yeah, so they follow the hypes, the ideas of others, etc. Um, then uh, you have the people who are in a crisis and but don't have stable commitments yet. They are called moratoriums and moratorium from 
from the, uh, the, the delay in, in development. But they are in the middle of the crisis in some sense. Um, and uh, they, are in, they are struggling with, to come with good uh, strategies for their lives. Uh, but because they, the strategies are not crystallized yet, uh, they, they don't have a stable uh, identity as well. They are searchers uh, in their lives. So, so uh, I guess you all know people like that. Um, and then um, you have people with a stable commitment and who did not have a crisis. So these are people uh, who grew up in a certain, with a certain idea and then went in that idea without ever really questioning it. And they become the apparatchiks of the system that they are part of, yeah, of, of, the, um, uh, of the, the corporate system, of uh, they, they, they just do the same thing as their parents did, uh, those kind of things. Those are called foreclosures. And they are called foreclosures because they they prevented for themselves, uh, to some extent at least, uh, the, the the development of uh, of their own identity before they could uh, create the ideal identity for themselves. But they, at some point in, li in life, they might actually do that. Uh, so it's not a nothing of this is an endpoint. Well, the only end endpoint is the achieved identity, and those are people who slow who show clear. Uh, commitments, and they had a crisis in which they broke with their youth uh, and adopted a number of strategies that are unique for themselves, are identifying for themselves, uh, and they have an achieved identity, which doesn't mean that they uh, don't change anymore because they do, uh, but they can always build on their own strategies yeah, and, 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 and use them always productively because you, they don't have to change their strategies all the time. So those are the four uh, different uh, identity types that, that Brzezonski uh, and uh, James Marcia have, have identified. Okay, so when you're talking about a crisis, is this like a trigger event where the individual starts to question um, the way that they were brought up or the manner, the system in which they exist? Or is it more of a sort of slow building do you think? It's a combination of both, but mainly the slow building. But it involves many different moments in which you question aspects of, of, of society, of your family, of yourself. And sometimes your questioning leads to uh, the idea that, oh, the, the, the conclusion, uh, that, that it's actually a pretty good thing. And, and then you adopt it. But uh, probably more often, your questioning leads to the rejection of something that you always took for granted, and then you replace it by something of a higher quality. And that is that crisis. Yeah? And, and, and that crisis then creates you, makes you into a more effective person who, for him or herself, uh, has adopted unique, well-functioning strategies, life strategies, uh, and therefore, formed for itself uh, an identity. Okay, um, so you're talking about a lot about how you have to form your own identity, but humans are obviously innately quite social beings. Do you think that you can still forge relationships without having this concept of a shared identity? Uh, well, everyone is of course always part of, of, a, of a peer group. Uh, but and, and the peer group may function in different ways. And so if the peer group is constantly uh, preventing you from questioning, then you will never learn. Uh, and that, that might eventually be kind of a toxic uh, development. Uh, while, while if you have a peer group uh, that, uh, uh, that helps you to, to, to question everything, and, and to, to, to figure, to, to explore the world in all kinds of different ways, and then that peer group will help you a lot in your development. Okay, so religious peer groups are maybe not the best for, uh, for self-actualization in this context. Well, in many religious groups, but that's, you can't say that as a general rule, but in many religious groups, uh, they, they are constantly 
uh, convincing themselves of a central dogma. Yeah, and uh, so they are constantly repeating it and, and discussing it and, and, and therefore uh, maintaining a system that can almost impossibly be really questioned. Uh, and and that, that can lock those people uh, in that religious or cult-like or whatever environment. Yes, but it's pretty much the same with with a big company that yes, almost yes. works exactly the same like that. Amazon. Or, or our mainstream society can also work like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, where everyone who says something that is a little bit out of the ordinary uh, is a conspiracy theorist. Uh, yeah. Which is a sign of uh, getting rid of that idea. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, religious environments are environments where people also think about the, the more abstract and, and possibly also really deeply valuable things in life. And spiritual, yeah. And that can be a great source of wisdom. Yeah, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. So I would say uh, some religious groups focus more on the first, some focus more on the, on the latter. And especially, I would say, uh, spirituality and, and, and religious ideas that help you to question the world and question your own knowledge and your own interpretation is, is about yeah, the best thing that you can do for your own uh, identity development. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so you're talking about sort of like this group identity. Do you think that this is... The, this sort of like in-group, out-group sort of dynamic, you can apply it to sort of many different social structures in our societies. Yes. Yeah. And that, that in-group dynamic, uh, that is very much going in the direction of foreclosures. Mm -hmm. uh, where yeah. where uh, you have, you commit yourself completely uh, to the strategies of a shared, or the shared strategies of a group. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that is... Um, not uh, conducive for the full development of your own identity. And it works as well, it, it works really well as long as the group exists. But if the group for whatever reason uh, disappears, then all of a sudden all your strategies that, you, that are very suitable for the group now all of a sudden are useless and then you are you know, kind of naked. Yeah. Because you're you're you are designed to fit into a very specific sort of in a very specific role, and if that role is no not longer needed or doesn't exist anymore, then you're going to feel pretty lost. Yeah, yeah. So that is the danger of the foreclosed identity. Okay. So if we've been talking about sort of groups and how identity relates to groups, so how does identity relate to maybe behaviour? Um, well, of, because it is associated with behavior, uh, uh, or it is associated with strategies, it is associated with behavior. Uh, but because it is associated with strategies, it is associated with how we perceive the world and how we deal with the information from the world. And therefore, it is associated with information processing. And so identity uh, has a very, very strong relationship with uh, with, with information processing. And you can say that there are three, in, within this field, they, they separate three different forms of, uh, of information processing. Uh, one is the informational uh, approach, uh, and that is a characteristics of achievers and moratoria. And that, that is a situation in which you really go for the information and try to learn from the world in the most honest way you can learn from the world. Um, the second uh, way of information processing is called normative. And in the normative processing mode, uh, you, which also sub, it was used called dogmatic, uh, you interpret everything uh, on its consequence on the system. So if something is uh, uh, at odds with the ideas of the system, you basically either ignore it or you attack it. Mm -hmm. uh, and why do you do that? Because you have to uh, protect the system with whom you identify. So it is a form of information processing, but it is a form of information processing that you now 
use to protect the system you're part of, and because you derive your identity from it, uh, you use it to protect your identity. So that is something that happens for the foreclosures. And then um, the diffusive avoidant uh, type of uh, information processing that is associated with uh, diffusions, and that is a way in which the information never really touches you and you never really learn from it. You take a little bit from it, but you don't think it through. You don't use it really uh, to, to build a good strategy, to build a stable understanding of the world. So then you end up in, in kind of a lot of uh, sometimes internally conflicting ideas about the world that you don't even know that are internally conflicting and therefore are a source of all kinds of problems and, and that helps you to lock yourself up in a world of problems. Does it make sense? Yes, that does make sense. So identity is closely related to how you how you interact with the world, so therefore how you react to the world, so hence your behavior. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. If there is um, a group of people who are all quite who have like thought about themselves very deeply and are quite wise and self-actualized and are pretty developed, do you think that they are more similar as people or do you think that they can take a variety of different identities? Well, that's an interesting one because a group of people who have a really well-developed identity um, feel very little need to form a group. Um, yeah, so... The weird thing is that we don't have very many groups of, uh, of well-developed identities be, uh, uh, because they, they are very independent people. They don't and, rely. And so, so they, they meet each other and they, they have respect for each other and they, they might uh, work with each other, but they don't need each other essentially. Yeah. So they are really independent minds and, and they go independently in society. And you will find them doing all kinds of little things in society where they use their own independence to make the world a little bit of a better place. For the foreclosures, uh, and they go for a system, they derive their identity from a system, and they form big groups. And the moment someone attacks the group or just does something that doesn't fit in the group, uh, they, the whole group will respond. Um, and, and for the diffusions, uh, they, they are constantly in search of of ideas that make them uh, that 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 can help them uh, understand the world a little bit better. Uh, so they typically follow all kinds of leaders, and they 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 go for, from one role model to another to another to another. Uh, and every every idea put in in in, in the media uh, as a good idea, whether it is. Um, say, uh, climate uh, or veganism or uh, whatever, doesn't matter, uh, they, or, or, or a religion, uh, they, they follow it and they try it for a while. Uh, and, and in the end, often it is not nourishing and it is not educating them, uh, so they have to go to something else. Okay, okay. so they rely, on, they, they rely on others to come up with these strategies. Yes, and even worse, they rely on others to build their own sense of self-esteem. Uh, so, because they don't have a deep sense of, they don't have a, a well-developed identity, they don't have a very high self-esteem. And so how can you get a self-esteem? By having others saying to you that you do wonderful things. Uh, so, the that, end that'll result build is, it. Sorry? That'll build it pretty quickly, yeah. Yeah, uh, so the end result is that you see them everywhere on, on Instagram, uh, picturing themselves uh, in the most beautiful situations, uh, uh, highly uh, uh, structured and, and I'd say that under their own control, uh, and then the picture is being made, and they go back to their own miserable lives, but they get a lot of likes on Instagram. Mm, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. So um, someone who is confident and wise and com confident within themselves doesn't necessarily care so much about others or do they just not care about the opinions of others or do they how how do they how do they interact with others yeah, that's a good one they um they care about the world 
okay. and they don't care so much about the uh, opinions of others. Uh, yes. Okay. Why? Because they they think that everyone is in is entitled uh, to have a well-founded opinion, okay. and they are able to create a well-founded opinion on which they can build their strategies. Mm -hmm. and, and the rest of the world also says something. I am entitled for my opinion, uh, but they don't add the, the the aspect that it should be a well-founded opinion. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so it is easy to criticize uh, people with a well-founded identity. They they usually they can defend their own opinions really well, uh, but. From the perspective of a foreclosure or a diffusion, uh, who who don't really, they can't defend their opinions so well because they never really thought about them very deeply. They just follow the crowd, and they have all kinds of majority type of arguments. Every everyone says this, so therefore, and we all think like this, so therefore. Everybody uh, knows that. Everybody knows, yeah, those kind of things. Yeah, so that that is is not how a well developed identity. Uh, things they, they just think what guys what is the, what works best in this world yeah, yeah so, so it's a different type of approach okay so how would you say that you're you said that well founded so how would you say that you can have a well founded opinion um question your own opinions constantly yeah okay. so um because it sounds difficult. It sounds like you have to be both very confident in your own abilities, but constantly questioning them as well. Yes. And that creates the basis for your confidence. And that's a very good question. So why? So, so how does it work? Uh, so you believe uh, firmly into something, uh, mm -hmm. global warming, uh, social justice, whatever. Uh, and then uh, you have to go to your biggest enemies and your biggest enemies, they are going to criticize you. Uh -huh. and, and some of their arguments actually make sense. Yeah. And then you have two ways of responding to it. One, you can ignore those people and there will be no development in your own. Uh, or you can uh, use their arguments, try to come with a better argument. And if you fail to come with a better argument, <laughs> the logical step would be uh, to to adopt that argument because it's better than you currently have, and then you are uh, developing your own uh, your own knowledge base, and with that you are adopt you're developing your own identity because you just made the, the choice that a certain set of arguments is better than your own argument. So you are in control of the content of your own mind. Okay, so. A wise person will never completely agree with a statement or completely disagree with a statement. A wise person will always try to improve his or her understanding of everything. Okay. And therefore, uh, he, he or she will never settle in a fixed uh, uh, idea about anything. It is always in flux and because mm -hmm. They know how to improve their ideas. Their ideas in flux become better and better and better. Okay. Uh, and they yeah. don't know in which direction they will come better because they are just, and that is also part of the open ended development. Uh, at any point in time, you can discover something that leads you to question another part of your, uh, of your knowledge base. Yeah, so, someone who is an apparatchik in the system with a foreclosed identity structure, uh, they will never do this because. Uh, the, then the moment they do this, they become a dissident in their own structure. Yeah. Yeah. And and actually that is happening. So people become dissidents in uh, in all kinds of formal structures simply because they 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 start self actualizing. They start uh, developing their own identity. Then they look at their organizations and where they are part of, and then they say, oh, what we are doing is actually not so ethical. And mm -hmm. then they become say whistleblowers. And then you see that uh, they move out of their social system, become more independent thinkers, and at the same time they are uh, the enemy of the system for a while. Yeah. And they are. They, they, they the system rejects them. Yeah, and they feel disgusted. They feel, yeah. Okay. So 
when you're talking, so these four goers, the ones that uh, sort of just go along with their system, follow leaders, do you think it's stressful for them to be encountered with um, lots of information which contradicts with their system? And do you think that this can have negative effects on mental health? So that in order to almost protect themselves, they might just accept and unquestion and move and sort of like sort of fit into the system out of ease? Yeah, I, I think so very much. And they typically follow leaders of all kinds. Yeah. So, uh, so they follow a leader and if the leader helps them to, to develop their own identity, they might benefit from it. But if the leader is just someone who wants to use them for, the, for his or her own ends, uh, then they, they are the, um, the pawns in the system yeah. uh, that follow the leader for a while and give their money and time and, and, and enthusiasm, etc., for the cause of the leader. So the leader multiplies his or her uh, effect in the world, uh, while the, the, the diffusion said uh, the people who, who adhere to this leader, at least for a while, uh, don't really benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think that this, I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of young uh, adults and ad adolescents. Do you think that this might be why sort of young teenagers can get very obsessed with, for example, celebrities or, for example, are very much more sensitive to, exa to like diets or like fads and things like this do you think that it appeals to them in a certain way because of like the stage of development that they're going through yeah exactly yeah okay. so uh, in your when you're a young adolescent or uh, in puberty or so uh, you have to you have to the, the identity development phase starts so, so you have to liberate yourself at least in part uh, from from ideas that you picked up in your early youth from your parents uh, from your from your parents etc so you start to look for all kinds of other uh, authorities in your life uh, and then the most beautiful uh, authorities for example that uh, you see constantly on tv uh, and uh, they they will become your role models then for a while yeah and the interesting thing is that those role models, if you uh, after a while, always go down the drain. Yeah. Uh, that's so. Uh, if you follow them too long, uh, you might uh, you might follow them in the same direction, uh, and uh, and have your body full with tattoos or so that you later regret. Um, that's simply because uh, your role model also had tattoos. Okay. Okay. So the so. And this is why often adults are less obsessive or do you think that or do you think that it's what do you think is why do you think that in young adults and in adolescence this is like identity is such a complex thing? Because a lot of I, I you hear a lot of kids like a lot of not a lot of kids, a lot of young teenagers, they set like coming back, I'm sure we know siblings or we can recognize it in ourselves, thinking that they don't fit into the world, that they're different from everyone else, that they're weird, that they're this, that they're that. Why do you think it's so particular during this period? Um, it is so particular because the natural tendency is to, to liberate yourself from the environment yeah. At the moment that you don't yet have the tools to to be independent. Yeah, so so the end result is that you uh, you are confronted with all kinds of things that you are not yet able to deal with really well. Okay. And you yeah. you need to make a number of mistakes and it needs to be painful for a while. How about and that is the crisis also. How about if the crisis if you if you avoid the crisis and or you, you engage in the crisis for a while and you think, oh, this is getting too scary for me, uh, so let's not have the crisis, uh, then, you, then you will not fully develop your own identity. Uh, but it's, identity development is typically something that happens in adolescence, but you see it that it happens actually everywhere in, in life. So all kinds of people, like I said, the whistleblowers, uh, that had a good career, uh, were were always part of a big organization and then start to develop their own ideas about the world and themselves in the world, etc. Uh, and then they have to move out of it. So okay. you see that 
also a lot with people, the, the moratoria, we haven't talked about so much, but they are the seekers, the, the, the people who who are questioning, uh, but are get locked in questioning all the time. Uh, so okay. they, they break with the youth and they go, well, they do uh, lots of yoga and then and they do, do meditation and then they try this and then they try that, etc. And so they are constantly uh, finding ways to, to develop themselves. Uh, yeah. And uh, the moment uh, they those those ways become stable and a good basis, uh, then the, then they develop into the uh, the achieved identity. Uh, but some people never find find those good ways, and then they are the eternal seekers. Yeah, that that are a little bit weird uh, and and very nice people usually, uh, but but they they are not as effective as the, the achieved uh, identity. Okay. Uh, and what do you think gets someone stuck in this stage of constant questioning? Just lack of confidence in oneself or just maybe they enjoy searching so much? Or I, I think the most important thing is that they never really discover the strategies that, that work. Yes. Uh, so, um, and they, so they never really adopt strategies because they become so proficient in it that they can actually make them work. Uh, so maybe there's also a sign of, of, of never really learning something up to the level that you can really trust on it. Okay. It, it, indecisiveness. And, yes. Schools also don't make this very easily. Uh, no. So we, uh, typically what we do at school, uh, teachers, they set well, they have an exam huh? and then uh, it's kind of a hoop and then you jump through the hoop huh? and then you are allowed to forget whatever you knew while you were jumping through the hoop. Yeah. So this doesn't lead to a very strong basis of anything. Uh, you just show that you're a very obedient obedient person mm -hmm. huh? who is able to, to show whatever mental trick you want to do. Um, uh, but the moment you build on those on those things that you knew during exam time, and you uh, you sh you use them in your life, uh, and you you use them as a basis of your own confidence, uh, then you are building on something, and that leads to a quite different uh, development. So if you become very proficient in a number of weird things that are very much associated with yourself, that is a very good basis for uh, your own uh, identity development, because. Yeah. Uh, you you start to identify yourself with the weird or whatever special uh, proficiency that you have. And it is a, a useful thing in your life. Okay. So do you think that schools, yeah, like art, most, let's say, let's say, for example, Western education styles, do you think that they have a detrimental impact upon the mental health of young adults? Yes. Yes. But not only that, all the whole of society from which the schools emerge. Uh, so also uh, the fact that we have a lot of contact now via uh, our our eye devices, smartphones, etc. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so that that also means that we we simply uh, lose a number of real world skills. Mm -hmm. um, and so how to respond to someone close to you who needs help or whatever, uh, or, or who is angry at you or who misinterprets you or whatever. Uh, so there are a lot of little things and also a, a number of big things. Uh, so if, if you can solve all kinds of problems by swiping, uh, that is quite different than solving problems in your own house that where swiping doesn't really help and where you need a real competence in order to solve something. I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, so it is a it is a one-sided type of a competence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this this sort of this this aspect trickles all the way through society. You feel? Yeah, or trickles up. Yeah, and it's part of the the signs of the time, probably. Maybe that is something that we can talk uh, about in a later. In a later uh, video. Yeah. And so how how societies develop and and and. Uh, yeah, well. Okay, so how do you think that mental health services 
can sort of facilitate positive changes in individuals who are struggling? Uh, that's a good one. Well, one thing, what we do now, uh, we have an individual who is struggling and uh, that individual gets uh, some sort of medicine. Uh, while we also know that uh, a cognitive uh, behavioral therapy uh, helps people to question their, their their life strategies and it works just as well or even better. Um, and so just feeling less rotten is maybe not the best strategy. Uh, so learning yourself out of a miserable situation uh, might be uh, more effective in the end and that definitely helps to develop your own identity. Um, so I'm, I'm not so much in favor of, of medication, although there is a role for it. Mm -hmm. There's all, yeah, in some uh, cases. In some cases, yeah. Uh, but, but learning yourself a way out of a difficult situation by, by self-reflection, um, by learning high quality skills, by learning to rely on those skills, um, by facing your, your demons instead mm -hmm. of avoiding them. Um, yeah. Uh, all those kind of things, they are, are very important. Yeah, because uh, I read that, for example, it, with people who have had trauma in their life, PTSD or trauma during, in their childhood, then they sometimes take psychedelics and then a therapist in the room sort of talks them through their worst fears or something like that and they can start to get to... Uh, form strategies in their brain and that in order to process the information differently is this the sort of techniques that you're talking about this might be one of the ways and you see it more and more uh, mm -hmm. so what those psychedelics do uh, they make it much more difficult to be in a, in a standard closed focused mindset in which you can think circular thoughts and uh, what what they do is they activate uh, say the right hemisphere uh, and with the right hemisphere they activate an outsider perspective and then you have a kind of an outsider perspective on your own situation yeah. uh, which which gives you which gets, gives a completely different meaning to your life and therefore also to uh, the the traumatic events and that helps many people because all of a sudden the trauma is no longer the only thing in their lives the only defining thing in their lives but it is now part, still an important part, but part of a much bigger picture that all of a sudden becomes visible. Okay. And, and the interesting thing is that you can have this result without psychedelics simply by developing an outsider perspective on your own functioning. On yourself, yeah. Yes, and that is that's also, maybe I should have mentioned that, that is something that, uh, that characterizes uh, people who are self-actualizing, people with an achieved identity structure it's a very important thing, and out creating an outsider perspective on yourself. Okay. And an so, honest outsider perspective on yourself. So not an outsider perspective that constantly says, you're an idiot, you're an idiot, you're an idiot. Uh, no, uh, it is a, an outsider perspective that doesn't judge you. Uh, you simply see yourself and, and you, you can see, okay, that worked, that didn't work so well, maybe try that one uh, next time. Uh, or uh, but, but it's it's not um, it is an, a non-judgment type of perspective. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the sort of as you said the demons sitting and you know yeah criticizing yeah. you. Yeah. No, no, it is a much more benign type of quiet type of um, of, of viewing at yourself, and it's okay. very difficult. And it's actually it is easier in nature. Uh, where you have wide views, for example, that, that helps to open that. Um, just being on your room where all the misery has happened or whatever, uh, that is not the place where this easily happens, uh, although uh, psychedelics and so can help to have it in that place. Okay. Yeah. So this is, so what you're talking about is basically a, the strategies, developing a strategy by which you are able to deal with traumatic 
experiences in the external world and just become more adaptable and better at dealing with them this is these are all the strategies that you're talking about these these yeah in part but if your if your strategies if your your demons are really deep uh, and, and and your mental problems are are, are very serious you need, you need uh, a professional to help you here yes okay yeah uh, so, um, uh, but, but still, uh, but, but this is valuable for everyone, regardless whether yes. they. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And developing that 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 outsider perspective that is definitely valuable for everyone. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Right. Nice. Um. Maybe we can call it a day or so. Almost. Yes. I don't think I have any more questions for you. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.